Hello and welcome back. I'm going to start this video off by saying that this is not going to be a whiskey review. I'm also going to start this off with a little bit of a disclaimer to say that this video is going to be all my own opinion and you are very welcome and entirely encouraged to taste everything yourself and to decide where to spend your own hard-earned money. With that out of the way, let's light the fuse on this thorny subject and take cover. So in this video I want to talk about something which I think is affecting a lot of whiskey drinkers out there, whiskey lovers, people that really appreciate their whiskey and buy their whiskey to open and drink and share and enjoy. And that thing is price. It's the limit that all of us have because everyone has their limit. It doesn't matter how much money you've got to spend. Everyone has a point where they look at a bottle of whiskey and they think, that no longer offers good value to me. And it's it's okay. We're all, probably all of us, probably almost all of us guilty of buying a bottle of whiskey which has some sort of gimmick or might be from your favourite distillery and you know that it's not going to give you good value for money but perhaps some sales and marketing trick or just brand loyalty, something makes you buy it. And sometimes you regret it, sometimes you don't. But sometimes those sort of prestige bottles offer some sort of value above what's actually in the bottle. And perhaps saddest of all, at least in my opinion, is when the value attached to that bottle is just the marketing and the prestige of owning the bottle. It's kind of like the Johnny Walker Blue Label effect. When you're buying whiskey to be seen drinking a certain whiskey, even though you're really not getting your value for money in the aromas and the flavours. But with the way things are going at the moment, I think more and more of us are finding out what our limits are, and perhaps more of us are realigning, recalibrating what our limits on spending are. And the reason why I decided to make this video now, because it's not a new thing, prices have been going up and up, possibly since the 90s late 90s might be the roots of when whiskey prices really started to ramp up but the reason why i decided to do this now is mostly down to one company and that's diageo diageo is the largest company today in modern scotch whiskey i think they own around a third of all the distilleries in scotland as well as a massive portfolio of other companies including things like guinness and if you're drinking alcohol, there's a reasonable chance on planet Earth that it comes from a Diageo brand, or at least Diageo owns shares in that company. Because even companies that, until recently, I'm going to use the example of Ardbeg, is a company that a lot of people have seen as independent and sort of a craft whiskey producing company for the whiskey drinker. But Diageo even has a minority share in Ardbeg. So they really are absolutely everywhere and they have a finger in just about every pie. But lately, and really this last 12 months, Diageo have really started to piss me off. I actually think that it seems more and more clear over these last few months that Diageo seem to be leading us down a dangerous road. It seems to me like they're trying to undercut and monopolise the bottom end of the market with all of those cheaply made, cheaply sold products like your Johnny Walker Black and your... No Wade Statement Cardoos and your Dalwini Winter's Gold and your Talisker Sky. It seems like they're trying to normalise poorly made, low ABV, No Wade Statement and No Wade Statement versions of what we used to buy. While at the same time, they're, they're actually very open about their mission to premiumise the Scotch whisky market. And we've really all seen that recently with what they've done to things like Talisker 18, but as well as a lot of the other Diageo products with things like the Open 14 going up in price a hell of a lot. So that combination of sort of undercutting everyone and squeezing everyone out of the reasonably priced bottom end of the market and premiumizing the top end. I do feel sorry for the honest integrity craft production distilleries at the moment because they're really in the middle of that getting squeezed. So the obvious one to look at when we're talking about expensive releases from Diageo is very hot topic at the moment the Diageo special releases which for 2022 have just been released depending on how long it takes to get this video out there they are available for pre-order I think they might have just gone on sale 
but looking at some of those releases, the prices were already high last year, and it seems like they're just going up and up. The prices this year, I think, are even more expensive than they were last year. In particular, one that really is a thorn in my side is this year's release from Mortlock. It's, it appears, unless I've missed it, and I have looked, to be a £250 no-age statement whiskey. And the fact that they've put this Mortlock out as a no-age statement release makes you wonder what they're trying to pull, because you look at other releases in the line, and I think they've all got age statements this year, and the youngest one, I believe, is the Talisker. Last year there was an 8-year-old Talisker, this year it's an 11-year-old Talisker. But if they're willing to put 8 years old on the label of that Talisker last year, how bloody young is this Mortlock that they're trying to sell us for £250? And you see it as well in the Lagavulin 12. Last year, people were complaining about the Lagavulin 12, selling, I think, for about £120. I bought that one, I reviewed it last year. Have a look at that video if you're interested. But £120 is very expensive for a large batch. It's not limited edition, no matter what they tell you. Large batch, it's only 12-year-old cask strength release. You look at other 12-year-old cask strength releases, just random example that I've thought of, the Bunnerhaven 12-year-old cask strength, that was just over half the price of this Lagavulin 12. And in my opinion, the Bunnerhaven's overpriced as well. But this year we're getting another similar Lagavulin 12 cask strength release. It's one that they do every year. And the price has gone up. It's only gone up a little bit, sort of five, ten pounds compared to last year's price. But it was really overpriced last year and we're just seeing that continuous trend of higher and higher prices. So for that reason, this is going to be, well, the first multiple entries on my list of whiskies that I won't buy. It's going to be the entire Diageo 2022 special releases. I don't think I'm going to bother with any of them because the prices are just taking the piss. They can't even be bothered to tell us if they're natural colour or not. And the way that the prices are just sky high and rocketing out of a lot of people's price ranges is just really offensive. I think if I was going to take a chance on any of the special releases from this year, it would probably be the Singleton release, the Singleton of Glenord, because that's one of the more affordable releases. I think it's about £120-£130, something like that. But even that, I went with uh, the Singleton release last year, which was the Singleton of Glendullen. But last year's Singleton was 19 years old. The Glenord that we're getting this year is four years younger than last year's release, and more expensive. Something else that really annoys me is the Singleton release, and it's probably the reason why I decided not to go for it, is that it's got a wine finish slapped on it, as many of these Diageo special releases have. If we look across the, the range, there's only eight special releases from Diageo this year. And if you look at them all, five out of those eight use either red wine, virgin oak, or PX casks. And if that mention of new American oak on the Oban release is virgin oak as well, then that's six out of the eight. And even worse than that, two of the remaining three have some sort of cask finish of some kind. Now, some people are going to disagree with me, and that's fine, but that's not right. In particular, I really have a problem with the practice of cask finishing old and rare whiskey. In my humble opinion, and it is just my opinion, if you take your best whiskey out of your best casks, and it still requires a flavouring with a finish of any kind, then was it really your best whiskey? This may or may not be a bit of an unpopular opinion, but I think that wine casks really are the ketchup, the tomato sauce of the whiskey world. Obviously, all distilleries, especially large volume distilleries like those, a lot of the ones owned by Diageo, they need to make their products unique and they need to justify those high prices. So they're obviously going to be reaching and searching for new and innovative ways to make their whiskey different to everything else that's out there, especially now that they've raised their prices so much that value for money is pretty much unobtainable. 
but it does make me wonder if all of these cask finishes that they're slapping on these old whiskies, which really should be able to stand and speak for themselves without a cask finish, it makes me wonder if these cask finishes are more of a selling point and something that's done so that they can mention it as being unique on the label rather than what's actually best for the whisky. So Diageo, I'm actually tempted to do something similar to what Ralphie's done in the past. He had a period where he decided not to review anything that wasn't a craft presentation, I think unless it was a blend. And I'm tempted to do a similar boycott of Diageo products because I think they're being really dishonest and I think what they're doing, it's especially annoying that they brag about their attempts to premiumize the whiskey market. And I think that it's bad for whiskey, it's bad for the industry and it's bad for us. I probably won't be boycotting Diageo because I've got so many Diageo whiskies on my shelves already that it just makes sense for me to review those ones that I've got that I've had on my shelf for several years but going forward I'm definitely going to be looking at buying less from Diageo. Looking at the, the other products that we've got that are available from Diageo you look at the, the flora and fauna range I'm a big fan of flora and fauna yeah it's probably all chill filtered it's probably all coloured to some extent it's only 43 percent but it's fantastic that they're making those whiskies available to us because if they hadn't done that we'd be relying on what we managed to scrape out of the independent bottlers which is probably not going to be a lot so it's great that they do make those available to us hats off Diageo for that one at least but the prices across the flora and fauna range they're going up as well not as much as things like Talisker 18 and the Oban 14, but they are creeping up. Other things from Diageo, Kleinlish and Kalila, they still seem pretty affordable and available. In my opinion, Lagavulin 16, I think my first bottle of Lagavulin 16 that I bought was about £35, and that wasn't that many years ago. It's now sitting at about £75, £80, and it's still at that week 43% so that one the Lagavulin 16 and the Open 14 in my opinion Diageo have declared themselves collectors malts rather than drinkers malts I think that the bare minimum effort they could have put in to justify those massive price hikes that we've had over the last few years they could have at least given us 46% but they've not even done that so what about other distilleries? Is this a problem that's affecting the whiskey industry across the board or is this something Diageo specific? I think it really varies. I think that there's definitely gouging going on from the other brands, especially there's evidence of gouging coming from the, the other three of the big four whiskey companies. It is definitely happening, but not everywhere. I think that Bacardi seem to be trudging along kind of the same as always. In particular, I think that out of the Bacardi group, there's been really good work at Glen Alkey lately. They've really improved what they're releasing. Things like the Glen Alkey 13 and 17 are excellent whiskies at a reasonable price. And I think it is a pretty similar situation over at Pernod Ricard. It's mostly business as usual. Yet, yeah, Abelor 18 is now twice the price that it used to be. It makes me think back to a few years ago, I was in the whiskey shop in Norwich and I was talking to the guy on the counter and I was saying to him how Abelor 18 is my favourite out of the Abelor range. I think that it's really good. And he agreed with me and said, yeah, it's good whiskey, but is it worth £80? <laughs> Obviously, with the prices that we've got now, if you saw Abelauer 18-year-old at £80 for a full bottle, you'd buy the entire shelf. Because we're now looking at about twice that price for a 500 milliliter bottle. But I think apart from that, Perno Ricard are not doing too badly. Going over to Beam Suntory, they really are the low-effort brigade of Scotch whisky. You look at the whiskies in the Beam Suntory stable, you've got Ardmore, Laphroaig, Ockentoshan, Bowmore. So what's the common theme there? Kind of mostly, with a few exceptions, low ABVs, uninspiring, low effort, just uninteresting whisky. I'd actually say that at Beam Suntory, it seems like Glengarry is probably the closest thing that they've got to a consistent craft-presented Scotch whisky distillery. 
And when you're saying that about Glengarry, I don't know what that says about the parent company. Edrington, they're another big player. But you look at the distilleries owned by Edrington, you've got Highland Park and McAllen in that group. So be prepared to sell a kidney if you want anything with a high age statement from any of those distilleries. I think that many informed, discerning whiskey drinkers have really kept Edrington and the high-priced releases from those prestigious distilleries in the Edrington group at arm's length for a while now, and it's all down to those prices. It's not really one of the big players in the Scotch industry, but looking at the group that owns Ardbeg and Glenmorangie, to be fair, in my opinion, and some people are going to disagree, for distilleries that are owned by a company that mines diamonds and sells handbags for tens of thousands of pounds... I don't think they're doing too bad. Both Ardbeg and Glenmorangie have well-presented and fairly priced offerings across most of their core ranges. And I think that it's really just, when you're talking about Ardbeg, it's those committee releases that really piss people off and get people's backs up. I've said this before, and every, it's becoming trendy to hate on Ardbeg now. It seems bizarre when you compare to where Ardbeg were 10 years ago, they were absolutely the whiskey geeks darlings everyone loved them they were the trendy hot distillery but when you look at what they're doing now it's becoming trendy to hate Ardbeg and it's really down to those committee releases and the prices of them and I've said before that I do think to their credit that most of the committee releases that we've had recently have at least been interesting saying that they are all without a doubt overpriced and to some extent, I think that's going to mean that going forwards, I am going to be paying them less attention. Just on the subject of being sick of Ardbeg, John over at Just Whiskey, he said that he's actually sold all of his collection of rare and old and expensive Ardbegs. He sent them all to auction. He's kind of sort of drawn a line on under it. He's had enough of it because it does seem... Like, apart from the core range, Ardbeg has jumped the shark a little bit. And I think that that's going to be an increasingly common opinion soon. Saying that, I do kind of want to try the Heavy Vapors release from Ardbeg. That's their committee release that is probably going to come out with, I would guess, for Fisila in 2023. That's going to be an Ardbeg where they turn off the purifier that they have on their stills for that kind of artificial reflux loop. The other one that we know about committee release from Ardbeg is Hypernova, Hype Anova. So that's going to be the continuation of the Supernova, the extremely heavily petered Ardbeg. And I couldn't really care less about that. I think that the previous Supernovas have been really overpriced. And I'm sure that this one will be as well. For an Ardbeg that has a little bit more peat in it, it's not really something that I'm going to be paying a lot of money for. But I think with Ardbeg committee releases... It's one of those whiskies, like what I was talking about before, you know that it's not going to be value for money. We really should all have realised by now that Ardbeg committee releases are not about value for money and we shouldn't expect that. But it all comes down to whether the gimmick that they give you, because they do put some effort into making them all different, it's about whether that gimmick justifies the artificially inflated price. And, of course, it depends on what price Ardbeg decide to put on it. With the heavy vapours, if the price is not too bad, I think that one's interesting enough to possibly get me to fork out some cash, but it depends on what the price is. With the Hypernova, probably not. So, moving on, another one of the, the big four, Grant's Distillery, or Grant's Group. So that's the group that owns Glenfiddich, Balveni, uh, all of those Speyside distilleries. I think that their prices aren't too bad, but I think that they are in dire and imminent danger of joining Beam Suntory in the low effort brigade, in particular with ABV. I think that Grants as a group, they produce good solid whiskey and at a fair price. I think that their prices haven't really risen that much compared to other distilleries and groups, but 40% ABV is really not enough to qualify as quality whiskey in 2022 but to their credit at least they're not being as gouge on the prices as some distilleries so who does that leave we've been through the vast majority of the whiskey producing world at this point and most of them 
I'm not particularly impressed with what they're offering for to us. When you consider the, the price hikes that we're getting, we're really getting shafted as consumers. So who is doing well? I'd say that probably the only large whiskey producing group that is doing well at the moment is probably Distel. Most of the time, Distel as a group get it pretty much right. Not always. And the prices aren't too bad either. The Bunnerhaven 18 has crept up over the last few years. I used to get that stuff for about £55, £60 a bottle. Probably just under 10 years ago, it's now sitting at just over £100. But just over £100 for an 18-year-old Isle of Scotch, sadly, is not too bad these days. And obviously we'll ignore anything made by Bunnerhaven for Fisila. Because if you have a look at my reviews for those ones, they're all really bad value for money. But at least with Distel, you almost always get a craft presentation. I'd actually say that Distel is probably the only large whiskey producing group that is doing a good job at this point. Especially when you look at things like the Deanston and Le Chig 18 year old. They're really some of the last remaining 18 year old whiskies from anywhere in Scotland that you can regularly get for under £100. And it must be said that the 12 year olds coming from Bunnhaven, Le Chig, Tobermory, and Deanston, they're all really reasonably priced at £40, £45 as well. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you are going to be saying you haven't mentioned Springbank yet. <laughs> you haven't mentioned the Springbank group. Are you going to say that they're doing a good job? They make good whiskey, and the prices are fair until you get to kind of like the 18 year old and up stuff. But Springbank is not going to be a group, a company that I'm going to recommend or a, a whiskey that I'm going to buy at the moment. And that's probably not going to change until either the whiskey flippers calm down or are forced to calm down when they start losing money on the things that they buy up. Or until Springbank Group meets demand, which from what I gathered when I talked to the people that work at Springbank when I was there a few years ago, it's probably not going to happen. They know that there is more demand than supply for their whiskey, but they're not interested in expanding from what I gathered when I talked to them. And that's fair enough. Expansion when it comes to Scotch whiskey distilleries is a very expensive and very risky investment. So for the Springbank group to trundle on and keep doing what they're doing and making enough money to pay the bills and put bread on everyone's table is completely understandable and kind of admirable but saying that the way things are and it's not Springbank's fault it's the secondary market's fault and it's greedy people's fault the Springbank group including Kilkerran, Hazelburn, Longrow all of them it's really become a flippers brand and it just isn't worth the pain or the price that we have to pay to enjoy those whiskies so Springbank is not a brand that I'm going to be considering or giving any attention anytime soon. Moving on to some more positive news, another distillery slash group that I do think is doing a really good job is the Loch Lomond group. So the Loch Lomond group is Loch Lomond with their brands like Inch Murren, Inch Fad, and all of those, as well as the Glen Scotia distillery in Campbelltown. They're not the most exciting whiskies to a lot of people, but I think that across the board they're making some pretty solid, honestly presented and reasonably priced stuff. If you haven't tried anything from Glen Scotia or Loch Lomond for quite a while, I think that they've made some improvements and it's honestly presented and honestly priced. Decent stuff that's worth checking out. Another one that I think still offers really good value is Brooklady over on Isla. I think that when you look at their sort of standard presentation stuff like your Port Charlottes and your unpeated Brookladdies, apart from the Brooklady Classic, which I think is a bit of a dud. I think that all of their standard core range stuff is really well made and really well priced. Obviously, I'm not including Black Art and Octomore in that because they're, to me, I think they're really in the same category as the Ardbeg Committee releases. You're paying a massive premium for something which is hopefully a little bit interesting, a little bit different. In my opinion, those Black Arts and Octomores, they're really sort of splurge purchases, special occasion one-offs, just to get something different. 
but I think that most of like the the Brocladi, Isla Barley, and Organics, and especially the Port Charlotte releases, are still offering consistent good value. And I'll just give a little passing mention to Edradour. Edradour is owned by Signatory, and I think that they, as they always have been, they've produ- been producing interesting whiskey at a decent price. They're a really good small-scale distillery and one that I always enjoy going back to occasionally, but it is a little bit of an acquired taste sometimes. But there is one group that I haven't talked about yet, and it's a group that I think is doing really well, and they're offering some really interesting things at usually some fair prices, and I wonder if you guys can tell me it's not independent bottlers, when we're talking about OB whiskey, there is one group that I still think offers good value. And I'll just get my notes. I'll read some of them for you. And you can see if you can guess what the common theme, what the group is here. Ardner Merkin, Glenn Wivis, Loch Lee, Isle of Arran, Kilhoman, Wolfburn. So what is the common theme there? Well, I'm sure you've all guessed it by now. They're all new or newish distilleries. And I really like that when you look at new distilleries as a group, and most of them, or a lot of them, are independents, and they're all offering really good presentations, usually at a fairish price, even if a few of them haven't really been around long enough to offer a truly mature style yet. I think that they're offering some really good stuff, and I think that the established whiskey distilleries should really wake up and pay attention to what they're doing and be a bit concerned at the kind of thing that we're getting that's becoming normalised from these independent new distilleries. Obviously, whiskey is a market which the majority of whiskey sold is blended whiskey and the majority of whiskey sold is not being sold to people like us. It's a commodity product that is pushed out in the volumes to people in pubs and clubs and people drinking mixes. But I do think that at least when you talk about the discerning whiskey drinker, which makes up a larger percentage of the whiskey consuming market every year, I really think that the established distilleries are going to fall out of favour with those discerning whiskey drinkers if they continue to raise prices without trying to keep up. Sadly, what impact that will have? Probably just that a lot of those distilleries will do what Diageo are doing and concentrate more and more of their effort on that narrow bottom end, bottom shelf segment of the market. I think that if anything, it's not going to mean that the new distilleries go out of business or focus on the high end stuff. It's just going to mean that your Lagavulin 16 goes up and up in price until it becomes completely unavailable or unaffordable or both. And I think that would absolutely be a shame. So hopefully anyone that's stuck with me in this video for this long, because it's been going on for quite a while now, thank you for sticking with me. What do you think about the way that prices are going up and up? What do you think about the modern whiskey market? And who are your winners and losers of the whiskey industry in 2022? Thanks for watching and cheers.